All right, all right, all right. Hello, everybody. Um, all right, before we get started, uh, since people are still trickling in, so, Niemen Shu Shongorn Shu Okay, and if you're an English speaker, please raise your hand. Great. If you're super, super fluent in English, but Nisha Jongorin, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, so we have one hesitant person there. So uh, what this means is, is that uh, about two-thirds of the audience is Chinese and doesn't feel comfortable saying that they're super fluent, and the rest of you are English, um, or speak English probably close to natively. Um, I am going to speak English during this talk, uh, which is good for everybody, especially me, because I speak Mandarin very poorly. Um, so uh, I will go a bit slower. And one other thing that I wanted to announce and say about this talk is, unfortunately, my co-presenter, uh, Ding Ma, is not able to be here for family reasons. So I'm going to be presenting his part of the talk as well on confidential containers, uh, something that I only learned about when preparing the talk slides and, and the uh, talk presentation. So I'll go into much more detail with the Intoto project, which I was one of the creators of. OK, so let's get started. So um, fundamentally, the Confidential Containers Project and the things that uh, confidential computing in general is focused on is about trust assumptions. And there's a natural question of what do you trust in the cloud? And in general, when you run code in a container, you're trusting really everything else running on that system other than maybe other containers. You're trusting the hardware, is safe and doing all the right things. You're trusting that the kernel is doing all the right things. You're trusting that all the rest of the sort of infrastructure that's in place, container D, are doing the right things that somebody at your hosting provider, if you're renting hosting from you know, a provider like Amazon or Microsoft or Google or somebody, you're trusting that those people who work at that company are not going and tampering with your data or looking at things that they shouldn't look at, right? So what's really interesting about this concept about confidential containers and that project in general is it tries to say, well, what trust assumptions should we have? Could we make it so that we don't have to have quite so much trust in so many different people, uh, in so many different technologies. And so the real goal of confidential containers is to minimize trust in the cloud provider. So that even if there's an evil system administrator at you know, whoever your hosting provider is, they can't go in and tamper with your containers and steal your data and so on. So with confidential containers, the items that are in blue here on the diagram um, have actually some protection against all sorts of malicious actions, which you don't usually get inside of uh, a cloud environment. Usually if container D or you know, whatever you're running uh, that does you know, those aspects of uh, the container landscape for you are hacked, then all bets are off from a security standpoint. So I'm gonna talk only a little bit about how this works um, because unfortunately Ding is unable to be here. But basically confidential containers and confidential computing in general builds on concepts from trusted platform modules so what this does is this uses different uh, built-in hardware protections that exist inside of many modern processors 
And it uses those concepts so that you get a root of trust and build up from there in order to um, have a chain of trust and to have what are called um, attestations, although we're gonna use that word in a different way in a little bit, that um, go and describe what software is running in a trusted way. And so what this basically allows you to do is it allows you to really only have to trust your silicon vendor, you know, your processor manufacturer, people like that, as opposed to always needing to go and trust, um, you know, all of these other parties that we saw before. However, uh, confidential containers does have a lot of trust assumptions that remain, which would make a lot of sense. It's a very hard problem to have a way to do computation that um, you know, doesn't have a lot of these assumptions. And uh, in general, the concept is focused on boot and startup time validation of the things that it is going and running. And a real question that you have in a system like this is, how do you know that the thing that you're running is actually the thing you're supposed to be running? And that is the focus of the second part of this talk. And to really get into that, we need to talk first about how is software made? So in general, I'm just gonna present a kind of silly, very simple diagram here. There's lots of different ways to draw this. Um, but you can imagine that you have a version control system. You're probably using Git and some form of hosting for Git if you're like most software projects. And you might do some testing. Um, you can do testing over things like your source code, like linting and stuff like this. Or you can do testing over the things that you build, uh, like with fuzzing and unit testing and stuff like that. So, and many projects will have both of these steps, but in my very simple example here, I'm just showing you one of those. Um, and then you also will go and you'll have a build process by which you turn your source code into something you're going to execute. And then you will go and package it up in some way. You'll containerize it. You'll do whatever, depending on your environment. And then you'll go and ship it off. And a real problem is, is that attackers can hack basically everywhere in this diagram, and even in lots of places that I haven't described. So I'll show you some historical examples of these. Um, so yeah, Free Software Foundation was hacked, um, VSFTP, they, oh, this was kind of an interesting one where the FBI allegedly backdoored OpenBSD, which is really bad. Juniper was hacked. This is allegedly by the National Science, or the, sorry, <laughs> the um, National Security Agency, the NSA, inside of America. So even the American government and a lot of those agencies are going and potentially hacking into these kind of organizations. And of course, you know, things that we all care about, like the Linux uh, source code repo, have also been hacked over time, and so on. And so, I want to say that if I wanted to, I could put, have put you know, 30 or 40 examples up of this happening. This is just kind of a quick selection. This is a, you know, not an isolated problem. Um, it's also very possible to go and hack the build system. And this has been known for a long time. Uh, Ken Thompson referenced this about how to put undetectable backdoors into build systems. Um, Apple had a big problem with Xcode Ghost. Um, Fedora had a uh, hack happen quite a while ago um, where uh, hackers were able to go and get into their infrastructure and steal their signing key and go and using that signing key, they went and uh, then signed a bunch of malicious packages. And I actually reached out to Fedora um, when this first happened I saw some of the Fedora team because I had been doing work on um, package manager security at that time. And I said, uh, you know, if 
we've just done a whole bunch of work on this. A bunch of the package managers are using our work, including Yum. Um, if you want, I'd be happy to you know, look at or give you any thoughts I have on any security d design you have. And the response that I got was basically, uh, well, we could tell you about it, but we're afraid it would compromise the security of our design if we tell people what it is. And as a security person, that's always a really bad sign if people are not willing to tell you what their design is. But they were actually, I, I found out what it was because they were actually hacked about eight months later. Um, and uh, when they were hacked, they revealed what their design was. Basically, they had used a TPM to do signing in their infrastructure. And uh, so when they got hacked the second time, rather than the hacker stealing their signing key and downloading it and using it to sign packages offline, they just uploaded the malicious software they wanted to sign to the build server and just signed it on there. So it really didn't provide them any protection. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of examples of this, including solar winds is another one that people talk about a lot, where uh, allegedly hackers from Russia uh, went and broke in and um, actually changed code right before it went into the compiler so that it inserted code that had malicious backdoors and things like this. Um, and yes, of course, there's also a bunch of compromises that can happen in the packaging step. Um, I'll just go a little quickly through this so we have time for everything else. Um, there's a lot of really interesting security bugs here. Um, and finally, testing is another thing that often gets overlooked, so I'm going to spend a little time trying to convince you that this is an important problem. Um, the problem is that it's not uncommon for an organization to believe that they have run tests or to have a process for running tests and then accidentally release something that didn't go through their QA process. This actually happens quite a lot. Happened to Linux kernel. Um, Windows had an interesting situation where they released an update that only went to certain countries that uh, do a lot of censorship and only went to mirrors that really serve those countries. And so the security community was thinking that um, maybe Microsoft was pushing out a backdoored version of Windows for those users in order to let them be compromised by their governments. But like two weeks after that happened, they accidentally pushed another update to a different set of update servers somewhere else. So then people said, no, maybe it really was a mistake, um, as Microsoft claimed the first time. So, uh, but this has happened for other companies. Apple, other major tech companies have done this. Lots of groups have accidentally pushed out an update that was only supposed to be a beta update or only supposed to be um, sent out, you know, tested or something, but not, not actually a production update. And even worse than this, hackers can uh, hack all kinds of other places in between steps. So in between your, your code and your build process, a hacker could interfere and take and rather than build the thing that came out of your version control system, have you build something different entirely. Um, rather than have you package the thing that, you're, um, that was built by your build system, have you packaged something else? So The question is, how do we fix this? And today, there's lots of different solutions that work at different points of the design space. So there's a bunch of things here with Git signing and using other kind of version control protection mechanisms. Um, in fact, we actually created the... Uh, the git tag signing mechanism that git uses. Uh, we found a bunch of flaws in the way git was doing tag signing and worked with their community to upstream some fixes there. And we're working and have been working since to upstream uh, and work to address other issues inside of that part of the design space. Uh, another aspect that has a bunch of problems here uh, but has a bunch of solutions is the build process. And there are a lot of really exciting things that people have done with build security. Um, the one that I'd like to highlight the most is the Reproducible Builds project. And this is the idea that you can go and take and build software on two different machines with two moderately different configurations and actually get 
bitwise identical copies of the software. And this lets you go and do verification that your software supply chain, the build process part of it, doesn't seem to be backdoored because you have perhaps even two different compilers, at least in theory, running two different operating systems, running two different pieces of hardware that built exactly the same thing. Um, and there's also a bunch of work that's happened in the packaging step. Um, we've done a bunch of work in this area. I mentioned I'd done a bunch of work with the Linux package managers. I also created, um, and one of the creators at least of the Tuff project, uh, which I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but Tuff is used. Um, and there's automotive versions of it that are used in automotive grade Linux and other stuff like that. So, but that's not really what this talk is about. Um, there's also something that you may have heard of called an S-bomb. Who's heard of an S-bomb before? Okay. Who uses S-bombs today? Okay, a lot fewer hands, but that's, it's still good. That's a lot more hands than I would have seen probably a year or two ago. Um, this is an effort to try to go and capture information about the software supply chain process. And um, it's quite a useful um, thing. It's kind of the way I think a lot of people think of it is it's like the ingredients label on a package of food where it tells you what's in it. Um, but the problem is that SBOMs in practice are often not very accurate. The SBOM often doesn't match what is said. It's, there's also a lot of missing information and so on with it. Um, and while there's a lot of work going on to try to improve this, this is definitely, there's definitely still a big gap here. So um, at least today, the way most SBOMs are generated and the way most things happen, it's perhaps better to treat them as informational rather than security critical information you can rely on especially in situations where you might have an attacker who's compromised parts of your infrastructure. Okay, so with all of these point solutions, a natural question is, have we fixed the problem? And the answer is, well, really, no, we haven't. Um, because you don't know that these steps were all correctly followed. You don't know they were done by the right people. You don't, you know, you're not resistant to situations where an attacker has compromised or modified or, you know, become part of your infrastructure. And so the goal of the Intoto project and what it provides to, you know, many projects, including, um, you know, some work that we're doing now with confidential containers, is working to secure the complete software supply chain. And so we want to verifiably define the steps of the software supply chain. We want to define who the actors are who do those steps, which in our system they're called functionaries, and guarantee that everything happens according to the way it's defined and nothing else occurs. So the way that we do this <clears throat> is we have a definition of what the software supply chain is supposed to look like that's uh, in a document called an in-total layout. And an in-total layout consists of a series of steps. So for our simple example we had before, we have our different steps that occur and it describes basically what happens in each of those steps, uh, which parties hold keys. Uh, in this case, we have these functionaries. These are the, the you know, these could be people like a system administrator that has a key, or it could be a key inside of a TPM or some other aspect like that. Um, and then each step uh, has something that it produces that comes out of the step. And it also, a step may have things that it takes into the step. So for instance, in a lot of projects, the way that you're going to make a production release it starts with you tagging, uh, creating a tag inside of Git and signing that tag. And then the build system takes that, uh, that signed tag version of your code and actually goes and builds it. And then the, the thing that the build system produces is you know, binaries and so on. And then that's the thing that actually gets 
packaged and shipped off to your users. And so the rules inside of the layout actually link all of these different aspects together. Um, and then uh, this layout itself is signed by a party in our system um, who is, we call the project owner, basically ha uh, serves as a root of trust for Intoto to say, um, you know, this is the layout that you're supposed to follow. And um, importantly, when you do each of the steps that you're going to do in the software supply chain, you generate um, evidence called links for every step. These are also called attestations. In fact, if you've heard of salsa attestations or other attestation formats, um, they use in toto attestations underneath. So salsa is an op opinioned layer on top of in toto uh, attestation metadata. And so uh, each of these steps, as they run, they go, they create these. Uh, like attestations or links. And then um, what you can do for verification is you can bundle this all together. You put the layout, you put the attestations together, and you have the actual thing that you're shipping. You send it to the end user, and then the end user can go and just check to make sure that everything works and is verified according to the policy. Um, so, See here, how am I doing on time? I have enough time to talk about this. Okay, so I'll go through this in a little more detail so that you can understand um, in you know a bit more about how this works and what happens here. Um, so the layout describes in JSON um, exactly which functionaries uh, keys exist exactly what actions are supposed to pass at every single layer and how all this works. Um, it also contains other information like expiration dates and so on. So for instance, a layout might indicate something like um, that uh, a specific um, test process is supposed to return a certain error code. Like when you run the unit tests, you should have an error code zero instead of uh, an error code negative one or something else like that. And this is all signed by the project owner for authenticity, and it lists the public keys for all the functionaries here. You can do things like um, key rotation and revocation and change uh, functionaries and handle compromise situations and all these other cases by um, using in toto layouts to do so. Then the individual steps contained in the layout describe operations in the software supply chain. These are things like, once again, the build process and so on. Um, and they're performed by different functionaries who provide signed link metadata as proof the step was carried out. It's important to note that these don't have to be computational things. For instance, if you have a lawyer who performs a license review to sign off to say a certain open source license is okay, they can just create an in toto attestation and say, I've approved this. And um, that will be linked to the actual you know, hash of the license that they've approved and it will all be uh, correctly indicated in there. Um, and in general, the steps limit the actions a functionary can perform, it describes uh, things about what the functionary is able to do and also describes things like how the materials and products, how the sort of inputs and outputs from the steps all connect together. Um, yeah, and so within a step, you also limit the trust that you apply um, by having different rules about this, saying, for instance, you know, maybe you're saying the build process is able to create a binary with this name. Um, that would be a very normal step to do, um, but everything is done in a least privileged manner. We don't just blindly give privileges to steps and just let them do whatever. You go and you specify this. And usually the way this happens in practice is 
you'll just run your normal supply chain and Intoto can watch what you do and then say, this is what I see, does this look right? And you can take a peek and you know, tweak it a little if you need to. But you can do things like, um, you know, this prevents situations that you have today where you know, for some Linux distributions, the same set of keys are trusted. Um, you're either a trusted developer or you're not. And so if you're the person who's supposed to be doing, let's say, the, um, you know, the Pig Latin translation, language translation, you shouldn't also have access to like, change the kernel source code. And, and you know modify the kernel package, but in many uh, distributions today, you do have that privilege. Um, not with things like Intoto, where the artifact rules will limit actually what people are able to do in different steps. So um, you can have a process where, like creation says, there shouldn't be this thing to start with, but it should exist after this step. Um, and you link steps together using rules. Match says that basically this file has to have the same uh, secure hash with the products that came from this other step. And so this is how you can ensure things like your, um, you know, the things that came out of your build process are the things you package. The things that you tagged are the things that went into the build process. It does all of that. So yeah, it ensures that, in this case, the VCS to, or the, yeah, works this way. Um, and then inspections can be used to verify metadata within every, every step. Um, they're performed by the client and it can provide, it can use additional um, link and other metadata attestations and stuff like this. So if you're doing normal salsa things today, you're mostly doing um, just like isolated pieces of link metadata along with inspections. Um, for the most part, uh, salsa installs uh, tend not to use layouts yet because they require a little more work to set up. Um, so for example, here an inspection would do something like ensure that all of your commits are signed if you have Git signing turned on. Um, verify that only certain people who are allowed are the ones who've done the merges to master. You can have those types of things be done in inspections. Okay, um, so I'm gonna wrap up and I wanna leave plenty of time for questions and back and forth with the audience because I know when I go to a talk, I often think that's the most valuable thing is to listen to the speaker answer questions rather than um, death by PowerPoint, which is what sometimes it turns into. Um, so to wrap up, I'll uh, mention a few things that I hope you take away from this. So securing the software supply chain is really important and absolutely confidential containers is a really important use case that we're really excited to be working with on this project. Um, in Toto, is a Linux Foundation project that's widely used in industry, so you'll see it popping up all over the place. Pretty much if you hear someone talk about a supply chain attestation, what they're really saying is in Toto underneath. Um, we were the first tool, like we were doing this before it was cool. I don't know if supply chain security is cool now, but if it is, then we were doing it before it was cool. Um, when we still had to convince people, no, somebody could really break into your compiler and stuff like this. Um, and uh, the, um, my former PhD student, Santiago Torres Arias, uh, has done an amazing job with this project. Um, he was in my office for many, many months, um, almost a year, where we worked out on the whiteboard different approaches for trying to handle uh, like a candidate set we take in, I think, I don't know, a, a dozen or so real world software supply chains from different organizations and tried to work out exactly how to do a lot of the metadata signing and storage in a way that worked well for everybody. And after, you know, nine months or so of, of finding little problems in everything that we'd done, we finally settled on what we use in Intoto 
And um, we're really pleased to see that a lot of people who've come after us, um, it's been very common that they come and say, oh, well, I like in toto, but I think I want to do the metadata this way. And almost always, in fact, I think to date, it's always been one of the things we thought of and then tried and found it didn't work for some reason. So then we go and say, oh, well, you have this problem if you do it, and you have this problem, and you have this problem. And then they say, well, what do you think we should do? And it's like, oh, just use our, just use our simple signing framework. And so it's what a lot of folks have done. Um, so yeah, I encourage you all to give Intoto a try and let us know any thoughts or questions or things like that. We're a really friendly community um, and always welcome participation from others. So um, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. Okay, let, let me answer it. Let me, yeah, let, let me answer that question first, and then I'll listen to your second question. But I'm going to repeat your question first because I want to make sure everybody heard it and, it, and it's on the recording. So um, your question is: Is that uh, is it critical to record things from like a TPM or et cetera as that uh, are as part of the build process, or do you really get any advantage if you don't have something like? TPM recording or other kind of root of trust for your functionaries in a system like Intoto. Is that a good? Okay. So um, you do. You do get an advantage to recording it using Intoto. You do not get the same level of advantage by doing, um, by using a TPM. TPM is much stronger basis for you to do attestations on top of but you still get a lot from just signing things with functionaries in the right places. And we've actually gone and done an analysis using uh, the software supply chain catalog of vulnerabilities that are maintained by Tag Security and the CNCF, which by the way is another friendly community that I'm a member of and I encourage anybody who's interested to come to our meetings and join. Um, anyway, so, um, we, we went through and looked at a lot of historical compromises, and a lot of them would not have necessarily been protected um, with you know, TPMs or with other stuff like this. Things need to happen in the right place. But you get a lot just by signing with functionaries. You actually get you know, a very substantial percentage. Um, when TPMs are used in some environments, that's just going to raise the bar and make those folks already so much harder to hack. So it adds value, but um, right now the bar is low enough that attackers, it's, it's not clear how much of a difference it is between signing things and so on. Yeah. Uh, as TPM is uh, mm, uh, from my understanding, TPM is a very complicated device. Uh, should we use TPM or we should just uh, use some like uh, confidential computing technologies like TDS or uh, other measurements, just like the uh, RTMR, these values to implement a simple a simpler measurement uh, mechanism. Uh, what do you prefer? Is TPM is uh, is TPM is too complex? Um, I, so I, I will say that's a little more out of my area of expertise, but I'll take a shot at answering your question. Um, which is to say, in general, you you want to use whatever technologies you have that are available, but everything in security has a cost benefit trade off. And if the complexity is very high in using a system, you also have to look at what it protects against. TPMs tend to be good at giving you hashes of things at boot time. That tends to be what is fairly useful. And they tend to also end up with a 
fair number of assumptions about the security of the things that are running, like, you know, at lower levels that basically you don't have certain types of vulnerabilities and stuff like this. So it's, it's really hard to judge. Um, in general, most systems that have TPMs and do these types of things haven't been hacked. But then we also don't see a lot of insider attacks at cloud providers in general. And I think that probably the answer to that is, like, let's say you heard that one of the major cloud providers um, had the administrators going and looking through people's cloud environments and stealing company secrets. What do you think would happen to that cloud provider's stock price? What do you think would happen to their user base? That would all just go immediately down. So they're all, the cloud providers are very incentivized to play well and do a nice job in general. And so there's you know, a question about how much effort and thought you know, and work needs to be put into that aspect of it. So putting some protection in place probably gives you, you know, such a high bar that no one is going to cross it, is my thinking. Okay, thanks for your answering. Okay. Happy to take any more questions if anyone has one. Uh, just, just a moment, just wait for the microphone, please. I think my question is very easy, simple, because I do not uh, no idea of the in total. <laughs> sorry, uh, but I, I, uh, because I, uh, you and the previous uh, speakers uh, talk about many of the TPM. I do not know what's the stand for TPM. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just a, a trusted platform module. Um, the way to think about it is kind of like it's a thing in, inside your hardware that's like a secure processor that can do certain things. Um, and what it can do depends on the type of TPM that exists. There's, a, there's some variation. But in general, it lets you go and either run code in a more secure enclave-like environment. You might have heard of things like SGX and stuff like this are ways of doing that. Um, or it can do things like just have keys and stuff that it manages internally and then can compute hashes, like secure hashes over parts of memory. And then often what you'll do is you'll provide that to a third party. So part of the dream of TPMs, at least originally, is that you would be able to walk into an internet cafe back when that was a thing and uh, this is before cell phones were a thing. So imagine you don't have a smartphone and you wanted to sit down at a computer and log into your AOL account or your whatever it was at the time um, to check your email. And the idea was is that how do you know that that computer is trusted? Maybe you want to look at your bank stuff and other things. And part of the original motivation behind TPM was it would boot part of the system, and then this hardware would constantly be checking to make sure that no malicious code had run as part of the boot process, no malicious code had run later as you're doing different parts of the you know, BIOS and everything else, and no malicious code was running as part of the operating system. You'd loaded all the correct things, and then you would know that, okay, now my application, my web browser, my email client, my whatever it is that's running on here, I can trust it because it's running all the right things. Um, if you trust the, you have to trust the hardware maker, but it's a much lower barrier for that. Um, but it's really morphed into something different in the last five to 10 years where it's been a lot more about um, isolating bits of computation on a big running system because one of the problems with just doing everything at boot time is operating systems are very complex. They have lots of bits and pieces, they have lots of bugs, there's lots of other issues and stuff like this that can make them exploitable. And so being able to do more with things later in the process makes TPMs a lot more valuable, like makes trusted hardware a lot more valuable in practice. Um, so I hope that helped. Thank you very much.
Anyone else have a question or does anyone who's like a hardcore TPM nerd want to correct anything I said? Okay, looks like no more questions. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of your conference.